But how many know that when you start reading God's word, not only would it free you, not only would it educate you and instruct you, but God's word is wrapped, come on somebody, in the power to do it. Come on. See, when, when you read the word, it's like a tootsie roll. Come on, somebody. The, the word is there, but it's wrapped. It's wrapped with the power of God. Some of y'all go, man, I could use one of those right now. <laughs> it's wrapped with the power of God. So when you read God's word, with the word comes the power. Everybody say power. power. The power to execute it, to make it happen. So, so as, as you open your heart and your mind and you're open to, be, to do what God has called you to do, and I remember reading this as a very young man and thinking, no wonder my life is all jacked up. Come on, somebody. My stuff was completely out of sync, unaligned, completely going in another direction compared to what God's word says and what his instructions say as well. So the key was to line myself up. Everybody say, line myself up. You got to line yourself up with God's word. So the book of James is one of those books that I really, really love because it's, only, it's a short book. It's only five chapters, but those five chapters have so much in them. And you have to remember that when you start reading it, and we're going to start reading right now, the instructions are super clear. Like you don't have to wonder what James is talking about. It is straight up. He, he just comes at you the way he needs to come. Of course, the Holy Spirit is there. And of course, the Holy Spirit is moving. So I want to introduce you to James, the writer of this letter. See, but first, I want to begin by telling you who he is not. See, the James I want, to, into, I want you to meet here tonight is not the more well-known James of the Gospels, one of the sons of thunder, the brother of, the, of John the Beloved and, and the fisherman's son of Zebedee, because we read about that James throughout the whole Gospel. See, that well-known James often found himself in the inner circle. He was one, he, James was one of those that was close to Jesus. And you know, he's, he's not one of the three men. See, the James that wrote this book is not one of the three men that he chose to be with him during the most significant moments in his, in his ministry, like at the Mount of Transfiguration or even at the Garden of Gethsemane. See, shortly after the ascension of the resurrected Christ, this James was killed by a sword by King Herod. We read about that actually as part of the sermon that I preached during the conference in Acts chapter 12, where James was actually one of the first apostles that died for his faith. So you see, that's not the James that we're talking about today. See, the James I wanted you to meet was not in the inner circle, but probably knew Jesus better than anyone else. See, James, whose words we're going to study throughout the next four weeks, see, was in fact Jesus' half-brother. He was the naturally born son of Mary and Joseph. And you know, it's so, it's so funny when you begin to read it and you think about that. I thought, like, could you imagine being Jesus' brother, his younger brother? Like, come on, how many know Jesus, like, he didn't make mistakes very often. Come on, somebody. I mean, Jesus probably was really chill. The Bible says he didn't sin, right? So he was always carrying himself well. And I could just imagine Mary telling James, James, you need to be more like Jesus. <laughs> I may have heard that before. You need to be more like, I guarantee you, I don't think James was real happy with Jesus growing up. Because Jesus always got things right, while James was always struggling, going through stuff. I believe, I believe when they played together as children, how many of you guys remember those little, I mean, I know the guy, I, was, I just talked to the guys because I didn't play with dolls or anything, but we had the little army men. How many remember the little army toys? And the, uh, you would position them and, and they'd be shooting at each other. And I don't know, the girls, y'all were, y'all went into all that crazy stuff, but, but we used to do it, right? And all of a sudden, could you imagine them playing, hey, listen, who's going to, who's going to be the Israelites and the Egyptians this next go round? So he lined up all their little men, and all of a sudden, when, when James finally realized, wait a minute, later on in his life, he says, wait a minute, when we used to play, oh, and he used to wipe out all the Egyptians, come on, somebody. 
he would just wave his hand and all the Egyptians would fall out. And, and, and of course, maybe they were next to the bathtub, so they all fell in the water. Come on, somebody. That could have been prophetic or pathetic or something. I'm not sure. But at the end of the day, I could have just imagined them having fun as kids. But, but James going, man, Jesus, like, can you ever mess up? Like, you're like the perfect son. Like, like, I gotta, like your standards are so much higher than mine. And I'm just, I'm just struggling just to try to make it. So literally, being the, being the younger brother of Jesus had to have some challenges to it as well. And you see, they spent all this time playing, maybe in the dusty streets of Nazareth and working side by side in their father's uh, carpenter shop. Come on, somebody. I bet, you, I bet you Jesus got all his measurements right the first time. Come on, somebody. I just have a feeling he didn't have to measure twice and cut once. He just probably measured it and cut and got it right the first time. See, during Jesus' early life, James apparently cannot bring himself to believe that his brother was the long-awaited Messiah. You have to remember that Jesus left home, and, and all of a sudden, he's doing miracles and signs and wonders, and his little brother's at home going, man, come on, Gee, that's, that's, that's my brother, yo. That's like, like me and him used to chill, and, and now like he's doing all this, I mean, this amazing stuff, and I, I just don't get it. I, I just don't buy into it because I know a lot about him, and I just don't really believe. How many know that familiar, uh, the Bible says familiarity breeds contempt? Yep. Because if you know somebody too well, then you're not going to be able to respect and honor their anointing. Come on, somebody. Amen. Oh, that, that's, just, that's just a principle that we have to understand. So he's like going, no, nah, he, he's my brother. He's, he's my bro. Come on. He's not the Messiah. He's not the, the guy that, that, that's going to save the, the whole nation of Israel and, and, of course, the prophetic word. But see, J James did not believe in Jesus until after he resurrected. See, when you read the word of God, after Jesus rose from the grave, Paul writes this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He appeared to James, then to all the apostles. So Paul is saying that when Jesus came back, when Jesus rose from the dead, he visited his brother, James. And see, privately and personally, the risen Lord met with James and his little brother's life was never the same again. The brother that he had raised, uh, was raised up with was now uh, in, a, in, a, in a glorified body and he was walking around and, and it was just so powerful because he, he knew that he was killed and his mother had cried tears and Mary came back to the house and said, your big brother, I mean, they, they put him on a cross and so, so you could imagine what, ha what happened when all of a sudden he saw his brother alive again. And the Bible says that, that encounter changed his whole life. See, he also, when you begin to read about James, you'll find out that after his encounter with Jesus, he began to grow in faith and became the undisputed leader of the Jerusalem church. So him and Peter kind of kind of paired up and, be, and became the pastors or the leaders over the church in Jerusalem. See, he also convened the Jerusalem Council to determine whether Gentiles, check this out, whether Gentiles needed to obey the law of Moses in order to follow Jesus. See, that was a big argument back then. Paul and Barnabas and, and Peter and all these folks started discussing, well, if Gentiles are getting saved, there was part of the group was saying, well, they need to follow the law of Moses now too because if they're going to be saved, they need to also follow this. And Paul was saying, wait a minute, what are you guys talking about? These are Gentiles. These are people that God is saving. They're not Jews. So why should they uh, 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 obey all the traditional customs of the Jews? And during that council, as they began to discuss it back and forth, we read in Acts chapter 15, verses 13 through 19, as, as, as James steps up, and, it said, and they said this, he listened for every to finish, and when they did, here's what God's word says, and when they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. 
The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, this is James saying, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. So literally, James make, has the last word during the conversation, and he says, you know what? No. At the end of the day, here's what the, how, how many know he, he knew his word? Come on, somebody. Right away, he went, he said, listen, y'all are arguing about this, but look what God's word has to say. Come on, I mean, the word of God always has the final authority. That's why it's so important for us to understand God's word. And he pulled out the word of God and said, here's the final decision. It's being done by the word of God. How many know that when we need to make a decision, we need to understand that God's word has every answer to every problem, to every issue that we'll ever encounter. So we need to turn to God's word just like James did in this situation. And it ended. Come on, somebody. That was a drop mic moment. After that, he just dropped the mic and said, let's roll. Because at the end of the day, God's word always has the authority. You see, the apostle Paul also referred to James as a pillar of the church. He was one of those, one of those pillars that kind of just kind of carried the church and carried so much authority. And of course, tradition tells us that James was so de devoted to prayer that he was given the nickname Camel Knees. They called him camel knees because he spent so much, come on somebody, he spent so much time on his knees in prayer that he had calluses all over his knees. You see, James was a man that sought after God with all his heart and stayed connected to what God was doing. And see, today we are 2,000 years removed from James' writing, yet his letters remain remarkably relevant. Because God's word and the instructions that he gives every single one of us, those instructions were for the church back then, but it's also for the church today. It's the standard that we can live by so that we can please God. And the Bible says that with faith, you can please the Lord. And we need that kind of faith that comes through the word of God. And he just lays out some really plain instructions. Everybody say blueprint. blueprint. This is the blueprint to live successfully and to have the right attitude and learn how to manage your life. Everybody say manage your life. If you can manage your life the way, the, way, uh, uh, the way my brother James writes in this book, it will line you up for every blessing. And not only that, but it will draw out all the potential. Everybody say potential. potential. Say it like you mean it. Potential. potential. You have potential in you that needs to be drawn out. Come on, somebody. And God's word begins to speak into your life. And then all the things that need to be pushed to the side, God's word begins to push them to the side. Just like I, sh I showed you guys during my, my presentation where I poured the water inside the cup that was red. And as I continued to pour the water, what was so powerful about that is that sometimes we think we have to change ourselves before we come to God. Well, I mean, I've heard it so many times. Well, I can't come to church because I got all kind of crazy stuff in my life. I'll wait till I clean myself up before I come in. How many know it's impossible to change? Hallelujah. It's impossible to change ourselves any more than we are right now and then think that we're going to have the power to clean ourselves enough so that God can accept us. Because how many know that acceptance doesn't come because you're better than you were? Come on, somebody. Acceptance comes through the cross of Jesus Christ and through the blood that was shed on Calvary. You see, you're already accepted. You're already loved. You're already part of the family. You see, you can't get any better on your own. You have to allow the Holy Spirit to do it as well and to displace all those things that are inside of us as we continue to fill ourselves with God presence. So you see, why is this word still so relevant? See, because in this letter, James outlines how we can put our faith into action. Our faith into action in our normal day-to-day-to-day -to -day -to -day routines. See, our challenge tonight is not to know what Christ calls us to do. 
Our challenge tonight is not to know the instructions that God has given us. Our challenge is, is to do it. <laughs> Come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got to do it. You got to do it. See, at the end of the day, the, knowing the instructions is not enough if you're not actually doing the instructions. If you're not following the instructions, then really we're living a life that we have all this great knowledge, but we're not actually uh, it, um, applying that knowledge into our lives. See, our assignment is to practice what we preach. Oh, come on. Turn to the person next to you and say, neighbor, you got to practice what you preach. Come on. Man, if you don't walk it, don't talk it. Come on, somebody. Come on. If you don't walk it, don't talk it because then people look at you and call you a hypocrite. There's too many folks walking and preaching and talking and they're doing all this stuff. But they, if you don't walk it, there's no power. As a matter of fact, people like that end up keeping people out of God's kingdom. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Because that's the fair, the Pharisaic attitude. See, Jesus, when you see Jesus in the Bible, he, he never got upset at the sinners. You ever notice that? He never chewed out a, a person that was broken and said, man, you are jacked up for real. He just healed them in compassion. Well, who he got mad at were the Pharisees. Come on, somebody. Because they're supposed to know better. I believe that the church needs a Pharisectomy. Come on, somebody. A Pharisectomy. Get that spirit out of the church. Come on, get that spirit. Listen, we're, it's about being kind and compassionate and bringing people in. Jesus never, ever put anybody down because they were broken. I mean, as a matter of fact, it was, it was the opposite. When someone was broken, he was there to pick them up again. Come on, somebody. He was there to put all the pieces back together again, just like he did in your life and in my life as well. How many know that he is an expert at putting the pieces back together again? Amen. If you believe that, come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a good praise. Come on. See, in every paragraph, James reminds us that when we are walking in the spirit, we will not wear out the seat of our pants, but the soles of our shoes. Come on, somebody. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of folks walking around with their jeans all wore out. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Come on, man. At the end of the day, he says, no, no, don't let your jeans be worn out. Let your gym shoes be worn out. Come on, somebody, because you're running. Let your shoes, let the soles of your feet be worn out because you're constantly moving and doing what God has called you to do. He never called us to warm up you. Come on now. Oh, I, it gets quiet when I start talking about this kind of stuff. Come on. Is that pew pretty warm right now? <laughs> It's okay, you're in, you're in boot camp right now, right? So it's okay to come into the house of God, but you're not supposed to stay there. That's right. This is where you learn and then go out and do the work. Everybody say, do the work. Do the work. do the work outside the four walls of the church. That's where being a Christian really counts. That's where really doing God's work really counts. That's where laying hands on somebody and watching them get healed get, really counts. When burdens get lifted out of somebody's life, not just in the church, praise God for what happens in the church, but I'm told what's happening outside these four walls because the church was called to do that to take action to be able to do not just hear the word and go oh, man I'm learning so much I'll tell you what, you can learn all you want come on if you're not using it it's gonna get stale come on now it's gonna be stagnant it's like it's, it's just gonna stay there and eventually not work for anyone else See, James encouraged us to put shoe leather to what we believe. If you believe something, it should cause you to move. See, in his own words, the, uh, uh, James, of course, said Jesus, our Lord and Savior, when he speaks, he doesn't just want you to be a doer, I mean, a hearer of the word. Come on, somebody. He wants you to be a doer of it. Amen. So when you hear something that comes from God's word, you should try to apply it as soon as possible. You know, I remember when pastor was preaching when I was a, just a really young Christian. Whatever pastor said, I just did it, y'all. I want to, how many of you guys really want to change? Because you don't change with knowledge, you change with action. Because you can learn all this stuff, but if you don't apply it, so I just started applying everything. And one thing he talked about asking for forgiveness, and I decided to grab my phone book, my little phone thing, and started calling everybody on the phone. Come on, somebody. From A to Z. Come on. That was not good, y'all. Some of them folks are like, what? Is this Carlos? This is not the Carlos I know. 
And I said, yeah, I gave my life to Jesus. What? Are you out of your mind? Come on, what are you drinking, bro? What are you smoking? I said, no, no, listen, I did some stuff that I shouldn't have done, and I hurt you, and I'm so sorry. And some folks received it. Other folks thought I was just crazy, and they probably just ignored it. But I got it off my chest. Come on, somebody. How many know that when you ask somebody for forgiveness when you've wronged them, now the ball's in their court? Because I've asked for forgiveness. It's between you and God whether you decide to forgive me. And if you don't forgive me, then that's, I'll tell you what, the Bible says unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. So you see, it was, it's, it's about applying everything that God wants us to do in our lives. See, the importance of being doers was partially illustrated for me on a trip to Israel. And I went to Israel many years ago with a, with a probably about, I think it was like 35 pastors. I had an opportunity to go, and I'll tell you what, that was a blessing. It was through, uh, through uh, C, uh, to Kufi, it was the Christians United for Israel. So they got 35 pastors on the East Coast. I happened to be one of them, and I gotta tell you, that was such an amazing experience. And one of the things that was really fascinating when I got there, just when I started looking at it, was that I found something really, really, really interesting. And, and it was this, that, you know, in the, on the north side, the north side, in the north, the vibrant sea of Galilee, okay, is a beautiful blue, and in many cases, crystal clear, and full of all kinds of aquatic life. And I mean, it's just, it's just a beautiful, the sea of Galilee is really gorgeous. So when you go across it, you can just see how gorgeous that, that, that is, and of course, but, but in contrast, when you go on the south, in the south of the air of, the, of Israel, you find the Dead Sea. See, in the Dead Sea, there is no life because the water is stagnant, and the putrefied sulfur smells really, really bad. How many of when water just stands still for a long time, it gets to smelling pretty bad? Come on, son. It starts smelling really, and that's what it felt like. Now, now don't get me wrong. A lot of, there's so much salt in the Dead Sea. It's so much salt that nothing can live in it. It's completely, of course, the good news is that it's hard to drown. <laughs> because when you jump in the water, there's so much salt that it actually brings you to the top. So you see, it's really interesting, but, but how contrasting is that? See, first, what makes these two bodies, what makes these two bodies of water different? See, first, the Sea of Galilee has an inlet. It's the Jordan River. So the Jordan River flows into the, the, of course, into the Sea of Galilee, and of course, from the source, which is Mount Hermon, so the water comes down from the mountain, it goes in through, of course, the Jordan, and then goes right in. See, on the southern shore, the Sea of Galilee has an out, everybody say outlet. So it has an inlet and it has an outlet. So the water comes in one area and it goes out the other. And that's what makes it so powerful because water flows into it from the Jordan and then goes out into the valley. See, but just like the Sea of Galilee, the Dead Sea also has an inlet. And the inlet is also the Jordan River. So you see, one's in the north, one's in the south. The Jordan River connects to both of them. The only problem with the Dead Sea, come on somebody, even though the Jordan River flows in, nothing flows out. See, so that's the problem, that's the issue. See, it takes in, but it doesn't give out. And I believe that contrast that we're talking about is what is exactly what James is trying to get across to us. The point of his whole book is this. Vibrant believers not only take in, but they should also give out. Amen. See, they put the word they received, their input, and then they take action, which is... Oh, man, that was weak. Let's try that one more time. They get the word of God, which is your input, and then they do the work, and it's your... Your output. So you got input, you got output, things are flowing in, things are flowing out. Come on, somebody. There's life. And that's how life, and that's the word of God. That's, that's an example of being a, not just a doer, but also a, a hearer, but being a doer of the word because you can hear it, but you're going to do it. So there's an input and there's an output. And of course, when you begin to understand that this is actually what, what, what James is talking about. See, he wants us to know that his warning is this to every single one of us in this room. We could become so heavenly minded 
that we become no earthly good. Because we're just seeking the word. We're just downloading all the stuff we can. We're getting full. Come on, somebody. We're getting, we're getting a lot of Bible calories. Come on now. But we're not working them out. You got to work. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you got to work it out. You got to work out your salvation. See, he challenges us not to merely have our minds and hearts focused on the message. But we have to act on the message. That's why I love the ministry of, of the hope, the hope van. You know, going out into the streets. I tell you what, it is the most, to me, it's one of the most satisfying things that we do. I mean, way before we had the hope van, uh, the men's ministry for the last four years prior to COVID, we would go out every single Tuesday after the actual, uh, after we had our Bible study, we would go out together, front line, and we went to the front lines. We went out there and began to minister, and sometimes the weather was cold. <laughs> I mean, I remember standing out there going, man, it's been an hour. And my feet are freezing. Come on, somebody. And people were still coming by, and we were giving away hot dogs, and we were trying to be a, a blessing. But there was something about giving out. There's something about reaching out. There's something about exercising your faith and believing God to utilize everything that he's put inside of you, all your gifts and talents and everything else as well. So, so that by being God's light and salt, See, we're God's light and salt, so we need to shine. Come on, somebody. Yeah. We need to shine in the darkness and give flavor to the things around us to impact it as well. See, James' letter is probably the most practical of all the writings in the New Testament. And I like practical. How many of that faith is practical? That faith is just, faith you can exercise it in practical ways that make sense. And I believe when you continue to read this book, you'll see there are some real practical things that he talks about. In fact, you could take the whole book, come on, you could take the whole book of James and just, and here, here we go, just three words. It's the Nike slogan, just do it. Just, that's the whole book, just do it. Just whatever it is, just get her done. Come on, somebody. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. you got to get her done. <laughs> Some of y'all country folks say, hey, I like that. What part of Chicago are you from? <laughs> from the south side. Nah. Actually, from the north side. But anyway, in this book, as I continue to read it, and, and we read about the life of James, there's three things that really stood out about James that I believe all of us can learn from. It's, I think it's three really strong factors that if we implement these things into our lives on a regular basis, we too can walk full. Let me say, I want to walk full. I want to be fulfilled in my walk with Christ. And these three things are very simple. The first one, you can fill in your blanks. If you got the book of James book in front of you, little, little sheet like looks like this. The first one is this. He was a man who surrendered. He was a man who surrendered. See, James encountered the resurrected Christ and relinquished his whole life, come on, and to the will of the Lord. When he met his older brother and saw him resurrected, all of a sudden he just gave his life. He had been holding back. See, he also became an outstanding servant leader in the church who followed Jesus, listen to this, even though it cost him his life. He gave it all for Jesus. He gave it all because he realized that what else is there to do in life? In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, it says, And whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. And whenever you hear the word cross, taking up a cross means that something has to die. Come on, somebody. When, talk, when you hear the word cross, you, you think crucifixion. You think that God is saying, listen, you have to die to self. You have to deny yourself, die to yourself, and then follow me. Then you are worthy to be called my disciples. D.L. Moody said this, let God have your life. He can do, he can do more with it than you can. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm way too small to live for. I'm way too small. I, I don't want to live for myself. Come on, somebody. I mean, I'm just me. I, I want to live for what God has in my life and the calling that he has. And every one of us here in this place today needs to understand. See, if you don't surrender to Christ, 
you'll surrender to chaos. You'll surrender to all kinds of other things that will not build up your life. So surrendering to the Lord is the very best that we can do. The second thing we know about James is this. He was a man who prayed. He was a man of prayer. His nickname was Camel Knees. Could you imagine? I mean, them knees look jacked up. Come on now. When he walked around with his shorts on, man, people go, ooh, look at them knees, my brother. You got to cover them up. Drop them shorts down just a little bit more. At the end of the day, he spent so much time on his knees praying to God. He was a man of prayer, a man of power. See, prayer was not what he did. Prayer is who he was. It was in his DNA. See, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 and 18, it says this. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Listen to this. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Prayer is not just an optional activity that we do, a ritual, a religious ritual. The Bible says it is the will of God for every single one of us in this room. And if you want to remain in God's will, then prayer should be something you do on a regular basis. And remember, when life gives you more than you can stand, then it's time to kneel time to get before the Lord. Don't call your neighbor. Don't call your friend and start complaining over the phone. Get on your knees before the living God. Come on, somebody. Learn how to unload your burdens. The Bible says cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. So when you begin to learn that prayer really is the key that can get you so through so much stuff, we begin to realize that God really is the key. And, and the last thing is this. He was a man who acted. He was a man who acted. He was a man that took action. He, wouldn't, he didn't just sit in church learning and having a whole book full of notes and coming back every day. He wasn't a, he wasn't a man that just said, listen, I want to come to church to learn all this stuff. But, but church just became a place where people just come, they learn, come on somebody, they get delivered on Sunday at the altar, then they get back in their seats and they go home. And then, of course, the next Sunday, they get beat up all week. How many of we get beat up all all week we get all we go through all these challenges and then we come back to church oh here we go again I gotta unload all my prayers and all my troubles and I'm gonna just go off and it becomes a cycle of just living for God and being delivered every week come on now how many of God has more than that See, God says, listen, begin to walk in your purpose. I didn't call you to always walk and be delivered from something every single week. How about if you help somebody else get delivered? How about if you take your gifts and your talents and begin to use them? What if what you're being delivered from on a regular basis, you can be free from if you just reach into somebody else's life the way I've reached into your life, and now you're going to see your freedom because now you're doing for others. Come on. God will do for others what you do. I mean, for him, for you, what? <laughs> I'm going to get it right. I know what I was going to say. What you do for God really counts. What you do for others, God will do for you. So it's not a, turn to the neighbor and say, neighbor, neighbor. it's not about you. Not about oh my gosh. It's not about you. It's about what God wants to do through you. Listen, God wants you saved so you can help save somebody else. Come on, somebody. God wants you healed so you can heal somebody else. God wants you free and delivered so you can go free and deliver somebody else. God wants you restored so you can go restore somebody else. It's not about you, y'all. And the moment you realize that, there is a freedom, y'all, because God's got you. Because <laughs> God will take care of you if you believe that. And I believe, and I love that because he was a man of action. I love this. James chapter 2, verse 21 and 22 says this. Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. Amen. Oh, come on, somebody. See, your faith is seen by your actions, not where you sit on Sunday. Amen. Amen. People are like, oh, I serve the Lord. Hallelujah. I know exactly where my chair is on Sunday. Thank you, Jesus. But do we get up? 
because faith moved four men and they broke the roof. Come on, somebody. And they lowered a man into the presence of God. You see, faith begins to move and faith moves a woman through a crowd to touch the hem of Jesus' garment. Faith moved a blind man to shout when everybody said, shut up, bro. Amen. Come on. Everybody said, be quiet. He said, no. <laughs> Come on, son of David, have mercy on me. That was faith. When everybody else is opposing you and you stand your ground in faith, listen, that's the faith, come on, that we're talking about here. That you're not concerned about what everybody else is saying. You know what God is doing in your life and you're not about to tell anybody else. Listen, faith moved on a tax collector and he climbed up a tree just to see Jesus. Amen. That's faith. Come on, somebody. How many believe that that's faith? Put your hands to give the Lord a praise if you believe that. Are you willing to climb up a tree? <laughs> because you can't get a view of the Lord. Are you ready to go to a higher ground and a higher place to get a better view of who God is because people are blocking your way? At the end of the day, God wants us to rise above the circle. Everybody say rise. He wants you to rise up above the circumstances we're in and begin to look at Jesus. Begin to look for him. Because I love that story with, 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 uh, with um, what was it? Zacchaeus. <laughs> because Zacchaeus, because he moved and climbed up the tree, come on, somebody. He ended up having dinner with Jesus. Come on now. Jesus said, hey, I see your faith, little man. You done climbed up that tree. Come on. I want to go chill at your house tonight. See, God will show up when you move by the faith that he's given you. God will say, come on and come on. I want to sup with you today. See, if you're struggling, let me ask you a question. If you're struggling to put your faith in action, the message of James is for you. Today, we're just launching it. Today, I want to give you, I just want to give you a background of who the author is. And now we're going to, every week, we're going to start taking book, uh, book by uh, chapter by chapter. We're going to start going line by line and begin to talk about all the things that James finds so powerful. Because remember, the, the Word of God says that the book of James was written to the church that was scattered. Amen. Come on, somebody. They had left Jerusalem because they were being persecuted. And now he's writing a church to say, y'all been scattered. You left your homes. You packed your bags. You had to leave at night. There was a contract out on you. Come on, somebody. They were killing Jews. They were persecuting them. They said, we got to go. We got to leave this place. So he writes a letter saying, listen, to all of y'all that had to roll out. The word scattered, the word scattered there actually implies like scattering seeds. So you're not just being, they weren't just scattered. Those were seeds that were being scattered all over the known world. And what was so powerful about that? If they would have never been scattered, then the, the gospel would have gone any further than right there. Right. Amen. I mean, like, whatever the devil means for evil, God turns into something good. Oh, come on, give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, do better than that. Come on. You're, not, you're clapping for the Lord. See, this series will be designed to move you, to move this message from your head to your heart to your hands. So we can put our hands on what God has for us. We can move and begin to do exactly what God has called every one of us to do. And see, you'll discover that James isn't speaking to us about faith and works. He's talking to us about faith that works. The Bible says, hey, listen, you want to see my faith? You can see my faith by my action. You can see it by what I do. My faith is alive in me because it causes me to move in God's direction. So the ne next few Wednesdays, listen, come, invite some folks. This was just the introduction so you can know who the author was. But I, we're getting ready to go deep in this. This is going to be so good. I love this book. So I hope and pray you'll be here for the next four weeks as we go through the Word of God and, and be able to take this apart because you have to remember... There's a dying world that wants to see you walk it. Come on, somebody. 
There's a dying world that doesn't just want to hear you talk about it, wants to see faith in action. And when the world sees that, I believe that the world is upset and, and, and angry with the church, not because they don't believe there's a God. I guess I think they're angry because they can't see a Christian that's walking it. Because they can't see somebody actually doing it. And when they see that, then they realize there may be hope. Come on, somebody. Praise God. How many amens can I get on that right there? Put your hands together. Have you received something today? Put your hands together right now and give the Lord a praise.